Hi guys, it's Artem Mushin Makedonsky again on Business Storytelling and today with me is an expert, uh, Terence Gargiulo, a guru in storytelling, organizational uh, development consultant, founder, founder of Making Stories, uh, author of eight books and like three or four of them on storytelling and a huge experience. Terence, thank you so much for being with me today and sharing your knowledge. This is a great opportunity for us. My, my pleasure. It's a joy. Thank you for having me. Um, Terence, um, could you tell my audience a bit on uh, how did you come to the world of business storytelling? Like, what, what's your background in this theme? Sure, absolutely. I, I mean, I think, you know, with any path, it's never what you expect and it's never what you set out for as in any journey. And so as a child, you know, it was starting seeing a father who was a conductor and watching him with his baton and just with his eyes, with his power, to communicate, and as a child, I marveled at that and wondered, you know, what was that power about? And likewise, I had a mother who was a singer, and mm -hmm. um, a love affair between my mother and father. Six <laughs> years difference with the father sweeping uh, the young singer off of her uh, feet. But watching my mother and her ability to bring alive text, words and bring it to heart and to connect with both audiences and even with others that she led. I had experiences as a, as a performer myself being really changed and entering into a character uh, to such an extent that I, I felt like I no longer was there. This was a, an experience as a young boy around 11 years old uh, and performing. And in this particular um, opera, the boy is healed and those, performances, I actually felt like I was all mall, this character in the opera, and I felt that healing energy on the stage. And then I went on to be a, a, a fencer, and uh, all of this is moving up to this really odd moment in university when I bumped into a, a professor, and uh, this professor's class was called Imagining Who and How We Are, and there was his opening of reading this story to us, a story that was very popular and very well known by us all. And we sighed sentimentally about this story. And then Professor Iglesias, just with a twinkle in his eye and with a different inflection in his voice, brought this story alive in a completely different way. Yes. And it was that moment, it was at that moment where I suddenly had a vocabulary to talk about how are we connecting with self and how are we connecting with others and how are we changed in what is a world that is just vastly moving? You know, I, I um, last comment on this because I know you have lots of questions, but I was thinking for myself, what was my first experience, for example, of Russia? And my first experience of Russia was actually as a young athlete. I made our U.S. Junior World Championship team and in 1984. And at that time, I was all of like 15 or 16 years old. And um, I stepped off the plane in what was still the Cold War after, you know, the boycott of the 1980 Olympics and, the, you know, the, the 1984 Summer Olympics that then would come with its own set of tensions between the East and the West. And I stepped off on this, on this plane. Um, and there was this entirely different culture that I, that I became, um, you know, that I touched and that I immersed in. Um, and all of those stories that we carried, you know, about what the Cold War was and how we made sense of those things. So and just to kind of make an immediate, immediate connection, how my imagination was touched by, by Russia at a very, very young, uh, young age. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah. This is so huge and personal, you know, um, this, this thesis that you bring that storytelling is for uh, making us all come together. This is this is really great. I I hear something similar in uh, Mary Alice Arthur's. Uh, uh, you know, the, the types of storytelling first is influence, then it is the uh, communication and collect collective meaning making, and only then healing and holding. Like this, the third bit. I hear a lot of that in you. Like this third and final grade. This is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you've been doing this, the, the whole storytelling stuff for a while. Um, could you share with me, how does a business appreciate it? Like what, what do you do in, in organizational consulting with this topic? Like sure. how do you help a business? 
this? Sure. So, I mean, for, for me, in, it's, I also stumbled upon the practicality of storytelling very, very early. This is mm, about 1990. Um, excuse me, let me yeah, I'll, yeah, of course. off that phone so it doesn't interrupt our, our conversation. Um, I um, was doing, uh, had a small software uh, company, and we were doing early web to database um, CGI programming, how you connect databases and early websites. Again, mm -hmm. you know, this is very, very early 1990. And um, I, stumbled, I always cared about people and I had thought I wanted to do consulting, but what I stumbled upon was when I went into these organizations, the fastest way for me to understand what the requirements were was by listening to the day-to-day the -day experiences that people were having. And of course, because I cared about people and what people's jobs, how people's jobs and roles were, um, were defined, so sitting down with people in, in these organizations, the fastest way I could get to understanding what what the performance solution needed to be with the technology and the yeah. process and people's roles and how they worked with the information was by eliciting their experiences, AKA, or in other words, their, um, their stories. And now this is before agile and before we used user stories as a way of building requirements you know, for, for, you know, for, for software. And, and that then just expanded into an appreciation that um, we live in so much flux. Everything is in such a state of change in the society we live in today. Uh, obviously, these things have accelerated. Change is, um, you know, causing tremendous stress for people because yeah. it's very difficult to govern organizations. So the work I do today, in many ways, is how do we step in and deal with contradiction? How mm -hmm. do we deal with paradox? How do we deal with um, um, a multiplicity of of agendas and needs, competing needs in, in an organization. And to that, we put forward lots of different organizational strategies. They could be learning strategies, they could be employee engagement strategies. Um, but um, I, I would say that at the heart of it, it's, it's helping people to connect with themselves and with each other in a way that imagines possibilities where there where possibilities are emergent. It's not so much that there's a, there's a perfect answer. There's not an actual algorithm that gets me from point A to point B. It's how I'm gonna get there through others by each other respecting and accentuating the, the strength and the possibilities of one another. Wow, that's powerful. Like uh, all the work we do is just to make sure that people feel that they are in this together and they feel a part of this mechanism so basically yeah there's a tremendous amount of of trust you know in the in the modern organization ironically we've gotten better and better with more and more data and and we've actually tried to actually constrict and have more control well what storytelling teaches us about the nature of of life itself and really organizations have to mirror life if we're going to continue to sort of evolve and what we do societally, what we do through organizations, and organizations are a living, breathing organisms of our society. We spend so much time there. It's how we organize and move the resources that are part of our lives. So, um, you know, the, if we think of the body as a metaphor, then we know the body is, is complex. If I go down to the level of a cell, Inside the cell is the mitochondria and the, all these different little parts, and they all are highly differentiated. They all have very specific responsibilities, but they live in homeostasis. They live in balance yeah. they live because they're, they're well integrated with one another. And out of that comes complex behavior, emergent behavior that we can't, that we can't necessarily predict all the time. So in these organizations, what stories enable us to do is they are literally the lingua franca. They, they literally are a, an assembly language, if you will, for, for how individuals can both be connected to self and connected to other and in the process move in new directions strategically that are responsive and that are responsible to what the constraints of what needs to be done. You know, there's an imperative that the organization has to be profitable and has to create value, but it also has to create a safe and meaningful space for those who are involved in it. So really storytelling yeah. allows us in how we communicate and engage with one another to operate 
at that at that level at what I would call is a very sacred level. Yeah, that's 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 so wise. You know, uh, I miss out on that a lot because you know uh, I feel that most organizations are on an earlier stage of developing this uh, whole openness and uh, c community culture. This is great to hear. Um, okay, um, Terence, I have, uh, you know, that's, that's just a baseline question, but uh, you are talking about how can we strategically use stories in organizational uh, communication. And uh, maybe you could give me an example of uh, a client case or a project where you helped to develop this culture, like what was before and what was after. How, how, how did it happen? Yeah, so let me talk to a little bit about um, the last company that I spent a lot of time with. I, for, yeah. for two and a half years, I was chief storyteller at Accenture, and Accenture is a large technology company, uh, 450,000 people global. They've, uh, they've got wonderful operations there in, in, in Russia as well. And is the, Accenture a, a consulting company? Yes, they do a lot of system integration. Um, and a lot of and a lot of work in technology is is really where their what their company is is based in. Hmm, okay. And, um, so one of the challenges that that they had was the managing directors, the people who would go in and mm -hmm. be responsible for building relationships with with companies. And Accenture was very interested in selling, um, you know, technologies that could disrupt and really change a company, help it to become uh, very different. Um, you know, this might be something as simple as um, for a, a food company changing the way in which it, it gets their inventory by using RFID technology. So again, applying technology in a way that would allow that company to do business and therefore it would need to organize itself because the, the jobs that people would have, the information that would be available in the organization, the way decisions would be made, all of this would have cascading you know, like domino effect of yeah. change, um, throughout the organization. So we were trying to sell this work and this was in, in US dollars, you know, these are large m deals, hundred million dollar or more deals that often would go for, you know, 24, 36 months. So they're long, big types of, of, of uh, things. Yeah. The problem that Accenture was having is that the, or the managing directors would go in and try to bring a PowerPoint deck, but more importantly, it wasn't so much about the fact that they were trying to just communicate with PowerPoint. It was the fact that they didn't realize that what they needed to do was to go in and have a conversation and co-create something. And that the best way to gain that, to build that relationship for what might take 12 or even 18 months to sell. Because if I'm going to sell you $100 million worth of business, I don't do that in one or two sales meetings. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a process. And so they came in and they, they had their, you know, their neat book of, of here's the solution. We know your industry and, and here's what we've done and here's what should work for your industry. Yeah. And it was all about trying to be experts. So the first you know, thing that we did was, how do I change the mindset um, and the behavior? In fact, how do I increase the capacity of humility so that when I walk into your business, I walk into your business, I might know something about it, but I don't really have a keen appreciation. And I don't necessarily have a simple problem that I'm trying to solve with you. I am tackling something that's very complex. And so the best place and best way, if I'm going to build that relationship that will lead to $100 million worth of value for me as a consulting company, and hopefully, you know, billions or, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for you as, as a company that's taking this journey of, of implementing this disruptive technology, then I have to come in humbly. I have to come in in a way where I elicit your stories. I have to begin to co-create that solution. So I don't know what that solution looks like. Mm. And in fact, even if I'm talking to you, Mr. CEO, you have to be able to go and sell this. You have to be able to tell the story of what this technology, what this new approach, this disruption might do that will generate true value. 
So you've got to be able to see yourself in that story, be able to tell that story. And more importantly, we have to discover that story together and we have to then create a solution that takes current state to a future state in a way that all of us can talk about it, we can hold it, we can look at it, we can converse about it. And so that's very different than walking in and saying, I know your industry, here's a good starting point for us to talk about your solution, right? Yeah. So, um, you, know, that's a, you know, that's an example, working with those, with those salespeople from beginning of an engagement all the way through to, you know, when the deal was finally sold uh -huh. is helping them to show up in a very different way. Great. Um, there's, that's a great example. Um, I just want to specify one thing. Um, you know, this whole uh, story eliciting process really reminds me of uh, what Mike Bosworth uh, told uh, story tending, like you have storytelling and storytelling, vice versa. So, um, do you use any kind of techniques or maybe a structures or maybe story types in this process? Or are you more like a type of guy who's like a story is not about structure. It's not about story types and stuff. So if, if there is like a continuum, <laughs> where would you put yourself? And it's a great question. And it's a question that's always asked. And, and, and the answer is that, that it is, and it isn't right. You know, that, <laughs> that's true. There are store. There are some wonderful sto repeating story structures. Of course, there's some wonderful stories to actually, you know, tell. Of course, there are some consistent things that you might try to to try to elicit. But but really, what makes you know when I'm coaching people. So I'm and when I'm not yeah. trying to sell myself. Often, when you sell yourself, you have to try to package it in a way that's very simple, that that is repeatable, that can be talked about, that True. people wrap their hands around. But we're going to have a very real conversation here. Okay. <laughs> comes down to is heart and intentionality. When, when I, um, you know, even in the beginning of our conversation, you know, you established heart with me in two ways. I, this, this is, I know is not in the interview because it was before you started the tape, but two yeah. things happened, we'll call them out. You know, the first was you shared with me your son. You know, here you are at 10 o'clock at night, so you care enough about this <laughs> thing, you know, to have a conversation at 10 o'clock to accommodate someone in North America. That's care and intentionality. Next, you were authentic. I don't know you. And yet, with a beautiful smile on your face, you told me about your nine-month-year-old son and putting him, putting him to bed. You didn't dwell on it. You didn't, you know, but, but, but you were willing to give that to me. The next was when I asked a question, I, and I really wanted to understand how you yourself got passionate and interested about this whole area in storytelling. You were very authentic and very open with me in sharing that initial training, which was even about a story of your own you know, failure and surprise. And that immediately established attention, intentionality, authenticity, and trust, and also opened up me, by the way, with a willingness to, to share. You know, because, you know, quite frankly, I'm not going to, I'm not going to profit. I'm not going to necessarily get any business from this or anything. I'm doing this because even when you reached out to me, it was, I, I want to share with others. I want to give them, you know, and broaden our understanding of what story is. And you're talking to some wonderful people, some really wise people and doing that people that are doing great work in our discipline of organizational storytelling. So all of those things. Let me come back to your question was like, well, how do you open someone up and are there techniques? Are there consistent stories yeah. you tell? Well, yeah, I might have some stories that I come back to, like that story of how I got interested in storytelling. I tell that story, I, that's one of the stories I tell a fair amount in different versions, by the way, expanding yeah. that. But what matters is the heart. It's the intentionality. Storytelling works not because it's some you can use stories to manipulate, of course, but not because it's some um, formula or some machine. It works because, because it's human. And it's human because at, at, our, at our core, we want to connect with one another. We want to make sense of the world. We want to feel that we together can find joint meaning and that we can imagine poss possibilities. I mean, that's the sacredness of, of storytelling. So. Sure. When you begin with that and it comes forward in who and how you are and however you do that, sometimes the best way to elicit a story is to share a story. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's the construction of, of, of a question, you know, by using a simple marker like tell me about a time or, 
you know, I use that very simple word when, and you're already a natural storyteller, so it immediately elicited an experience for you. Um, you know, so, you know, those are just some of the things that, that um, but at, at, at the core, it's who you are and how you show up is, is how you'll be able to make that connection. Great. Thank you so much. This is, you know, it's amazing to see that you see that in different, in other people. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I've, I've heard this phrase that you just said, that to get someone's story, you can tell a story. And that was actually the first time I've heard about you in, this, in the book, nine, uh, The Circle of Nine Muses, I guess it was called. And it's, it's just, an, it's, a handbook for me right now <laughs> for organizational consulting. This is a great book. So um, <laughs> thanks to David Hutchins, we're talking right now. So, <laughs> okay. So um, turns, uh, you know, um, you once said that in an interview that uh, to tell a great business story, one should aim to be authentic, which you've already established. And uh, the other thesis was that, one should aim to put the client into the stories so that they can see themselves. And um, I know that there are a lot of tools to do that, like uh, metaphors and stuff, but could you maybe share your view? Uh, how do you put the client into the story so that the client sees them? Yeah, so I, I think the good news here is that we all have, we do all have different kind of thinking styles and personalities. And you even called it out earlier in your example of, of the mentor that you learned from. And you said, well, she was this really analytical person. So, you know, when you haven't the luxury of time and space, different people will go about preparing themselves through research. And so taking the time, if it's about how am I going to put this client in the story, then taking the time to actually do research and to put myself in their shoes, which may be something as simple as, you know, reviewing their website. It hmm. may be as simple as reading as many articles as I can about their industry. It may be pausing to reflect and say, what does this mean? You know, if, for example, stores are using checkout, self-checkout, what does that mean in terms of, you know, the customer experience? Because Amazon's creating other stores where people don't even use checkout. They can just walk out of the store and having just taken, you know, what they need. So what, what would that mean if I were going in to have a conversation with a retailer and they're, they're looking at different point of sale systems or kiosks, you know, types of situations. And, and we have to come up with a, a, a co-solution. Of, of maybe what new technologies or how they might approach this for their business. What does it feel like? What does it taste like? What, what do they see? You know, I think here human, you know, human centered design is really helpful because the idea is that if we can think enough and imagine enough and put ourselves in the shoes, then we will have some initial, you know, vocabulary will have the questions. And I think it's a humility too of being ready to probe before even necessarily thinking I have an exact translation. So I can probe with questions, I can probe with like painting a scene and saying, you know, do you think it would be anything like this? Or I was looking at this other retailer and I, and I saw that, you know, they limited it only to five items because the items are really big and very bulky and, and it, you know, having more than that was slowing others down in the line. You know, what does that feel like in your stores? I haven't really recently been in one of your stores. So you see what I'm doing? It's curiosity. Yeah. It's probing. It's humility. It's having thought about it, having imagined it in my own imagination, you know, a good storyteller, is really a story thinker. It's the difference between someone needs to make that picture and put it on the screen so that I know what's happening in the movie when I passively watch like images that someone else has selected on a screen, or like when we read a book and essentially the screen is off, our eyes are closed because the words have to be translated to images in our minds. So a good storyteller is always trying to conjure worlds, right? Putting together yeah. the pieces for him or herself and then know that that's just 
a model, it's just an approximation. So now I need to ask someone to come into this room and I tell them what I'm seeing. Oh, behind me is this bookshelf. And there's, in this menagerie, there's you know, some porcelain um, vases. And what do you see when you walk into my room and see on that bookshelf, right? You know, so it's yeah. been done collaboratively. Great, so that's the difference between the story telling and story thinking you, you know that's that's what where i was uh, actually wanting to put it because um you have those terms uh, up on your website they're like storytelling story listening story thinking so i am now uh like under beginning to understand what what is what but uh, could you comment a bit more how do they differentiate and uh maybe with some examples from you know, like business or life, uh, what's the difference between the three of them? Sure. Let's start with story thinking since we were, since we were. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Um, and let's use a couple of different examples. I mean, story, um, you know, story thinking, it, it, it really almost comes from um, a guy, uh, Roger Shank in 1991 wrote a book um, called Tell Me a Story. And mm -hmm. Roger Shank was doing work in artificial intelligence, early artificial intelligence, and trying to understand what makes a human smart. And one of the things he and the team discovered was that it's intelligence is being able to apply what is known in one domain into a novel domain. So mm -hmm. a simple example would be if um, I had never gone to an airport and never taken a plane, but I'd taken buses and I've taken trains, then if I walked into an airport for the first time, I would have some constructs of, okay, there's schedules. I have to go to, instead of going to yeah. a truck or to a bus stop, I have to go to a gate. And you start applying it in, from a known domain into a novel domain. That's very, very human, by the way. Even with all the strides we've made in, in artificial intelligence and the wonderful stuff happening, you know, even with machine learning, we're not anywhere near that kind of level of, of what the brain does. Hmm. So, so Roger Shank said that, you know, we work in terms of, of patterns. So when I talk about story thinking, I'm, I'm, and I'll give you a few more examples, because it's the most obtuse of kind of the three things that we'll talk about. But story thinking is, is, is saying that our brain synthesizes so that idea of taking something from one domain to another is really this idea of synthesis that um as i reflect on my experiences and there was a wonderful slavic you know writer vakal havel a former former czechoslovakia right and he said um you know the future of humanity i'm paraphrasing it but is is in the power of reflection is mm -hmm. in or i often like to quote uh, socrates make you know kind of put a twist on his quote, the unexamined life is not worth having. Well, I say the unexamined story is not worth having. Nice. So our experiences are, are stored as stories. So the first thing around story thinking is reflecting on those experiences so mm -hmm. that I can learn and I can, I can create networks because our mind is like little nodes and they are networked. What's beautiful about stories that people forget is that like a neural network, these connections are ever new. They're, they're, they're being recreated and strengthened and we're getting clusters when we get a stronger pattern of something, you know, then we see like a part of the network all, all lit up. So reflection, synthesis, and indexing. Indexing is, is like what we think of in a database. When I say, hey, what's your favorite movie? You might scratch your head and say, Terrence, do you mean comedy? Do you mean my favorite Russian movie or hmm, your favorite true. action film? What, I don't know if I know what you're asking it's because we all index information differently. So the richer my index, which comes from reflecting, by the way, when I say, oh, I had this conversation today and I was talking to this guy from Russia and we were talking about, and then I start putting meta language, right? I start indexing this conversation, my encounter with you so that in a novel situation, I might pull it back and it might help me make a connection that I haven't made before, which is why great cultures are constantly revisiting, for example, their religious stories, you know, the, in, in various Judeo-Christian and Muslim and different, in different traditions, people reread those stories over and over again. Why? Because 
we bring a new lens to it each time we come to it because we are different each time. Different sure. things are happening to us. And the story is not encoded with a single meaning. The encoding is in the network, in the meshing of how things are patterning together and in who I am, what light I'm bringing into that. So it's like a mirror. It's like a, it's like a piece of stained glass with lots of images. The light, where I shine the light, how much light and how diffusive the light is, is what I'm going to necessarily see in that collage of broken pieces of light. Right. So uh, again, in a leadership example, using stories as a tool for thinking, we do it in strategy work, in learning. It's something as simple as saying, um, what if leadership were like, and then I say, um, Game of Thrones, or I say, mm -hmm. uh, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, or, you know, I, I select, um, I, excuse me for not quickly here, I don't have an index of all the great Russian literature, you know, of course, I've, you know, read, uh, 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 crime and punishment and <laughs> right, you know I, I love Chekhov plays you know um, but I, you know my mind is not quickly working for example in in your in your lexicon but but if I brought up something that we both uh -huh. use, then that becomes like a little virtual reality simulator doesn't it yeah we play in that space because I can say hey in the Chekhov play um, Cherry Orchard you know when the character such and such does how is it like what happens in an organization and now suddenly what people don't understand who are analytical sometimes is that stories accelerate abstract thinking you're like well but stories are fluffy and if you Terrence if you use a metaphor or analogy it doesn't have a direct correspondence it's not very exact so I don't find it to be a very effective means for a con you know for a conversation if we're trying to be analytical au contraire because in fact it's from the the fact that it's abstract means that I don't have to decompose everything and that actually I can accelerate through ideas. And more importantly, we might have shared, when we talk about that character from Cherry Orchard, we have a shared place of immediate understanding. While we might not have the exact opinion of that character or that situation, we now have a place of tension where we can actually talk and we can do discovery, very deep discovery, very quick discovery, right? Right. That's, that's story thinking. Sorry, I gave you a lot there, but. No, 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 that's, that's amazing. I'm, I'm learning so much. Good. Um, st uh, story listening is the, mo the most important thing we do with storytelling at the core of it is listening. And unfortunately, here's the bad news. When you're trying to sell organizational storytelling work, you know, even the best of us, and I, I'm, I probably and uh, and guilty of not doing this because I don't tend to simplify storytelling even when I sell it to my clients but um, we tend to want to just talk about packaging stories up and hey I'm going to tell you help you to consistently tell let's say a hero's journey that has a clean beginning middle and end and you can use this story to always be influential or to help you sell or, or win or I'm going to help you get up on a stage and I'm going to help you because speaking is so important and communicating is so important. So I'm going to help you to be rich and compelling. And here's how you do it, right? You know, so we have to kind of package it and simplify it to such an extent that we turn it into, um, you know, we do a disservice, I think. So at the core, really, of storytelling is story listening. You know, the only reason to tell a story is to actually listen to a story in ourself and in others. So there's a lot that happens in the quiet space. It's happening right now. I can look in your eyes and I know that even as I've been trying to give quick little examples that aren't big stories, right? But I'm trying to operate in a in, in story and out, you know, story language, rich language of story. I can see that you're having all of your own images and, and experiences. Yeah. And it's right. So even when we don't elicit a story that is verbally shared outwardly, we ourselves need to be, through the stories that we're telling them, be revisiting them and encountering them in new ways. And others are going through that same process. Mm -hmm. so stories are about listening and eliciting because that's where the real work of story happens. That's, that's where the changes occur in who and how I am. It's not that you'll repeat my story and you were so moved and motivated by my story. It's about what happened in your own heart and mind that might lead you to a new insight. And it's in the imagination 
and in the insight that changes in behavior occur. Not again, because I was, I, I could be on a, on a big stage, I could entertain you, I could tell a great story that has the crowd in my hands, but if it doesn't touch your imagination and your heart, and something doesn't happen in you, if I just try to monopolize you and use broadband charisma to you know, you know, grab you in, in, that, in that way, then the story hasn't operated in the way in which stories are most powerful. Oh, um, so, so basically the most powerful ways to get someone's imagination to start working and meaning making. Am I hearing you right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's not about the sense giving that I give you, it's about the sense making that you do. Yeah, I love this, I love this differentiation. This is yeah. great. Yeah, I have to, uh, you know, my job is, a, if I go in and I'm leading a leadership session, you know, like you've done or probably still do, it's about creating a space and orchestrating and facilitating um, insight. You know, you probably saw on my website, but I mean on my LinkedIn page, but my little, my little uh, you know, quote is I have a passion for inciting, which means stirring up, right? Insight in others. It's not that I'm gonna be able to give you wisdom or insight, but can I create and put enough energy and authenticity and heart and space for your insights to come to life, to come to fruition? And that goes again, back to that sales example, it's really about people selling to themselves. Mark Benioff figured this out in, in Salesforce. Salesforce is a, is a cloud uh, service as a cloud platform that's used for customer relation management. It's used all over the world, very, very popular. And he says that his explosive growth of his company was from stories. He said the currency of what made his company grow was stories. And it wasn't the stories here his salespeople were telling, it was the stories that his customers were telling themselves and to other customers. Mm. Great. So basically that I, what I hear now is that the story is transfer and this knowledge and this unity comes with this transfer and it's, it's more even, even more valuable what you hear from the stories than, than what the, the person who told the stories put inside them when he was telling. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with having an intention in telling a story. Don't get me wrong. I mean, stories do encode information. I, I uh -huh. have the you probably saw that chart, but I, I have a chart yeah. of nine ways that stories function and their unique effects. And, and certainly, you know, you, you know, I have a reason for sharing a story. You know, if I'm going to go inside to a board meeting and I, I'm trying to perhaps lead a conversation about something, I will have an intention of trying to use a particular story with the hopes of maybe it eliciting that conversation. True. But I have some information encoded in that, but we tend to limit stories to that thinking that they're only about what I've encoded. No, it's about what you, de you decode and then what we recode together as we move forward because it's a conversation that moves forward. It's not the passive act of me giving you something and even the passive act of you taking it. It's what you do with it, right? That makes it vibrant and real and what I like to call living story. Great. Um, Terrence, ju just a small question. You, you know, there is a lot of what I see in the business storytelling right now, which is like uh, brand uh, story branding and uh, uh, stories, uh, sales and stories. And uh, the key reason for using this, uh, th those, this ki kind of knowledge is to tell a story, to influence someone into making some kind of a decision. But um, and it and it has uh, it has its influence because stories are really powerful. But what I am hearing is uh, a client would be more satisfied if he was led to make his own decisions. Am I hearing you right? Correct. Aren't we all? Isn't that isn't that a basic thing? Even with your nine month year old son, if you put two things together and you sort of guide him toward towards that, it will stick more when he makes that little decision, even if it's something as simple as, does he eat this food first or that, or that food? And they're both on his tray in front of him, you know? At, yeah, at, that's true. Or, you know, even the little ritual that you might do at, 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 be, at, at bedtime, you know, we start to give them a child, right? We start to give them little micro moments. We have to constrain, like any creative thing, creativity is not having freedom that just lets you do whatever the heck you want. 
Yeah. Creativity, in fact, even morality, even, even ethics for, a, for a viable society, a sacred society, is one in which there are constraints. But it's from those constraints that we then allow degrees of freedom. So in jazz, I say, we're going to play in the key of C major. And here's, here's the melodic line. Now from that, each jazz musician plays and creates beautiful music in different ways. And I don't tell them, him or her, what to do. But I do constrain it, right? Just like yeah. I do with the world. So it's the, it's, the same, it's the same idea here, right? These are, these are principles of, of which how we, we operate. Yeah. You know, I love it because, you know, the, um, I had an insight recently. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to teach storytelling. And the first thing I encounter is uh, people are in the disbelief that they don't have any stories and they cannot tell a story that will influence. And so I come from teaching them that a story can influence, like giving them structure and story types. And then when they are ready, I move to the next step, like uh, giving them this whole uh, look on the other side part of storytelling. And this, this actually works. And now I really understand how, how and why it works. Thank you so much. Oh, Terrence, uh, just one small question uh, from your website. Um, <clears throat> you've mentioned this table. Uh, could you maybe just a short version uh, could you tell me about the story audit and uh, how do you perform it and who does it in an organization like like sure. if there is a short version of it of course yeah so um uh this was with a wonderful guy uh patrick lamb i i, I co-developed this um very very simple tool that i use to initiate conversations with with clients to look at the various areas in which story work can be done and it's really just a reflective Set of, set of questions and, and Patrick, um, he's out of Knowledge Straits in Singapore and his deep depth is in taxonomy. So he's, he's done a lot of work in what's uh, uh, called knowledge management and then how do you actually create taxonomies and organizations or for systems in, in order to understand things. So, so we created a very simple taxonomy that looked at all the different dimensions of possible story work, things like strategy. You know, when a company is, is trying to define um, strategy, strategy has changed so much. We used to talk in terms of five years, and we talked in terms of three years. Now we can't even really talk in terms of one year. Yeah, that's true. And, and so story is, is a really agile way of actually approaching, approaching uh, strategy. It's also a way to accelerate that thinking like we talked about. Um, we look at the learning function. It looks at... Um, it looks at your, you know, the maturity of the communications and employee engagement inside of your, inside of your organization. Um, so, and I don't have it in front of me and I don't have it, I don't have it, even though I use it all the time, I don't have it memorized, but it's meant to lead a com conversation. People are, feel free to go to makingstories.net and, and grab it. Um, you know, I, I have it there for, for that purpose in the, in the spirit of, of sharing. But I think what it does do, because your question to me, even at the beginning, I was very impressed to see that you have an appreciation for the fact that story work goes much beyond, you know, just say leadership or how I teach you to tell a story or just sales, that it really touches every aspect of culture and of organizations. And there's lots of different interventions and lots of different ways in which we can actually design story interventions. And so that tool helps an organization look at its story maturity helps it to start thinking outside of the box beyond the obvious ways in which storytelling might be brought into an organization. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what that, uh, how I use that particular um, instrument. Great. That's great. Um, Terrence, do you mind if I uh, try my best and translate it into Russian just so I can share with, share it with here? I mean, with acknowledgements, of course. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. You have my great. permission. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, I have two more questions that I ask all the storytellers I encounter. And the first one would be, um, imagine there is a person who is starting to develop his storyteller skills. Like maybe he's on the step of influence or maybe he is, has a deeper understanding and anyway, he wants to be a better storyteller. What would you advise to this person, like what would be what your one advice? Become an observer. 
one of the storytelling when you when you look at um, when you look at my story model of of those three areas storytelling story story listening and story thinking it breaks down into nine different nine different skills one of the most in 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 the listening area one of the most powerful tools for a, a storyteller that will develop their capacity as a storyteller are their powers of observation hmm. and when you begin to notice uh, Sean Callahan talks about this too. He he has a, some wonderful deliberate practices around you know story noticing. We had done a webinar a number of years ago, and we gave people a whole bunch of you know story noticing you know things. These are something as simple as when you're in a conversation, and um, notice when someone tells a story. When do they move out of just talking or giving an opinion, and when do they move into telling a story? You know what is what changes? What do you hear? What do you observe? Um, another another activity for someone to, trying to develop themselves as a storyteller. When you observe something, you have an experience, reflect on it, then package it up, and then try it immediately as, as a story. And more importantly, hold it in your hand like a crystal and start rotating it so that the light moves in different directions, that you can cast light in different ways on it meaning that you can expand and collapse that story that that you can emphasize different things you can connect that story you know stories are like lego blocks they are like those wonderful russian stacking dolls you know that where <laughs> one is inside of the other right yeah yeah There's so many beautiful layers of or, or like a good onion um you know, there's so many beautiful layers to, to the story and how those stories reconstitute and reconnect. So you must first become a story observer to increase your capacity to help others to be storytellers. You know, it's very interesting, right? You have right. to yeah. increase your capacity as a story listener and story observer and story thinker before you can actually get into the craft of, you know, storytelling. Wow. Great. That's great to hear that you start from the top, like not from the telling, but from the thinking, thinking part. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the final question is, um, okay, there is a phrase that, that I've come up with and it goes like this. It takes one thing to get from a good story to a great story. And that one thing is. Love. Really? Love. It, when you operate from a place of love, like you care again about what it is that you want to communicate. You know, there's something too about love that also gives us permeability and flexibility um, to our, our story. It, it, it has um, osmosis, it, it, it opens up, it ha it, it, like a sponge. If, if my story again is just something that I hold like this, it's always only one thing and I'm going to use it as power over you or with myself or power in the world, you'll go far that way. You, you can achieve actually quite a bit that way, but at some point you will splinter and fall apart. It's brittle. It will drop and it, and, and it will not help you or help anyone else. So when I, when I love, I care about the people I'm communicating with. I care about what I'm sharing. I care about what value is going to be created in the world. Every utterance makes a difference. Every, every utterance, every thought makes a difference. We don't live in a void. We don't live in a vacuum. And so when I take that level of, of care and intentionality, the whole world opens up in new ways. Great. I just have no words. This is a great answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, Terrence, I've had such a great time talking with you. Thank you so much for this uh, interview. And um, if you could give me some context where my folks can find you uh, online and read about you and find the materials. Yeah, absolutely. Go to makingstories.net. Um, I would say, you know, I do have this incredible instrument. I've got both a short version and a long version and it measures these skills and you can find some information about, um, you know, there are 81 different behaviors and a lot of the experiential activities. Um, in fact, at some point you might want to translate some of those so that those can be shared, you know, in Russian, I'm, I'm open to that. Um, even this instrument, if you would like to 
um, translated into Russian and, and, and you know, f again, for a fee, because this is my IP, it does have to be licensed, but I'm happy, you know, to talk about anything like that. But go out to my website and, you know, poke around and thank you so much for what you're doing. Really, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terence. And I wish you all the great stories to come. Uh, I guess we'll stick around and maybe... stay in touch. Stay in close yeah. touch. Stay in touch. Thank you for all you're doing. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much.